All right, we're uh, ready to start with our presentation for Steps in Tree ID and North Texas Trees, highly prized by wildlife. And Rita Loki is going to introduce our speakers today. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd just uh, like to first say that um, I first met Lisa and Rick, I guess it was last uh, fall, uh, in the fall, that they became a uh, trail guide uh, leaders at Leela at our Lake Louisville environmental learning area and they are such an asset to uh, working with children because they have so much knowledge about trees and uh, plants um, so it gives me great uh, pleasure to have them speak to the chapter and other chapters today uh, they're going to present first steps in tree ID in North Texas trees that are highly prized by wildlife. Um, Lisa is um, a retired school teacher. Uh, let me restate that. She says she's a happily retired school teacher. And she um, loves iNaturalist. Um, she has, I think, over 10,000 observations and over 12,000 um, identifications made for others. And she's interested in all things nature with a focus on plants. Now both Lisa and Rick are members of the Blackland Prairie chapter, which is located, um, I guess, in Collin County, and they meet at the herd in McKinney, Texas. Now Rick, he owns bachelor's degree in forest management and an MBA, both from Stephen F. Austin State University. Uh, he is also a member of the City of Frisco's Urban Forestry Board and a volunteer trail guide at several places, including the Herd, Leela, and Frisco Parks and Nature Trails. Uh, so thank you, Rick and Lisa, for agreeing to present today. And uh, as Rita had mentioned, uh, we've got a couple of uh, different things we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, Lisa's going to go through some uh, fundamental steps for tree ID and uh, the physical characteristics of trees that you look at uh, in order to be able to identify trees. We thought that would be helpful as we go into part two of our talk, which will be uh, kind of a walk through the woods. We're gonna look at 18 of our native trees that are uh, highly prized by our wildlife uh, for many, um, many different aspects. Uh, and so that'll be a good walk, but uh, having this tree ID uh, review first will, will help you as we're talking through that. And there's a lot of content, so we're gonna move kind of quickly it's a full talk and we'll start right now. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Travis. It's great to be here. Um, last year I had designed a pocket brochure, as Rita mentioned, that we designed to use for our master naturalist trainees when we were getting them oriented to tree identification. Um, it's turned out we also use it with trail walks, tree talks, anytime we're introducing um, tree ID and we I put the link up there to that in the chat box. You're welcome to print off copies of that, use it however you like, um, share it any way you like. Um, and I'm going to go through just the first steps we use to um, orient people to tree identification. This will be old news for a lot of you, but if, if so, hopefully it will remind you what it was like when some of these things were new and harder for us. So this is the, the brochure. Like I said, it's uh, free to um, print out, use however you like. We're just gonna go over today just the very first few steps. So we start out um, key to the broadleaf trees. So by broadleaf, what we mean is really everything that we call leaves, anything that's not a conifer. In um, so the things that are linear, like pine needles, scales, like on a red cedar, those, those are the things that we do not mean. Those are the conifers. So we're focusing just on the broad leaves. So in North Central Texas, we're lucky because we really only have one um, conifer. The Eastern red cedar is the only native conifer common conifer here. So we rule out that we're welcome to go on to the brochure and start trying to, to identify our broadleaf trees. So the very first thing that we're going to look at, the first question is are leaves simple or compound? I'm going to 
spend a few minutes talking about that because it does trip beginners up. For if we've been doing this a while, this may seem really obvious to it to us, but it does trip beginners up sometimes. So by simple leaves, we just mean um, a one-piece leaf directly attached, and compound leaves have two or more parts. In North Central Texas, about 70% of our common species have simple leaves, and the other 30% have compound leaves. So the simplest definition um, of a simple leaf is it's one piece leaf growing directly from a woody stalk. So the woody stalk here, leaves growing directly from them. This is not always as obvious as it might seem to us. I've had um, students ask me if this might be a compound leaf. Um, it's a black willow. The, the twig that the leaves are growing from are, is very slender. And um, this is thrown people off sometimes. So, and, and again, the box elder maple or the box elder ash leaf maple, all the same tree. Um, this throws people off sometimes because the, the new growth and the twigs on this are green and it can throw people off. So the key feature that we tell people to look for is the bud at the base of a true leaf. So um, you can see even on these, the bud is small but you can see that. The related feature that we ask, that we look at is the leaf scar. This goes along with it, but when you see the scar, the scar of a leaf, whether you break it off right then or it's one that has fallen off in the fall, you can see that it's um, a very defined, obvious mark. You can see the, the outline, the epidermis of the leaf itself. Um, you can see the veins that were connecting it and the bud, it's very obvious there. You can see here back on the black willow that we were looking at early, earlier, even though the, the twig is so slender, the buds are very obvious there at the base of each leaf. A compound leaf, on the other hand, is made up of multiple parts, two or, or many. This particular leaf has 15 leaflets that go together to make up the leaf. So the, le the leaflets are connected to a rachis, which is a non-woody stalk, just basically this, an extension of the petiole of the leaf, just basically a stem. So it's not woody like a twig would be. And you can see that at the base of each leaflet, there is no bud. So this is, um, we're gonna look a little bit cl more closely at this particular compound leaf. We're gonna look at a section of it and we can see the rake is here. We have one leaflet attached and one leaflet that we've broken off. You can see at the base of that leaflet, no bud and the place where the, we've broken off the leaflet, I see a leaflet scar, but it's really barely even a mark. You can barely see it. So it's not like the definite leaf scar that we had when we broke off the leaf. And just to compare the um, leaf scar that we looked at on the previous slide, you see much more definite, the bud was very obvious, so that, that's a big difference. So once we've um, answered the first question, our second question is what kind of leaf attachment? Is it opposite or alternate? This one does not tend to trip people up as much. The opposite leaves are, um, there are two, two or sometimes three when we have a whorl, but two, typically two leaves growing at the same node. So at the very same level alternate leaves, just one leaf at each node, then on the other side of the twig, higher there'll be another leaf. The only way this does trip people up sometimes is um, if they're looking at the leaflets instead of the actual leaves, because a lot of trees with compound leaves will have alternate compound leaves, but the leaflets are opposite. So that's why we make sure we have a simpler compound leaf first, and then we go into opposite or alternate. Um, about, only about 20% of our species are, have opposite leaves, and the other, percent, the other 80% have alternate leaves. So it's always 
good news if we find a tree that has opposite leaves because that has narrowed it way down to just a few choices. And since that is so um, uncommon, it's worth remembering or memorizing those few trees that do have opposite leaves. So the mnemonic that we use is damper. And in that D is for dogwood. Um, rough leaf dogwood is the dogwood that we have around here. A is for ash. We have a few ashes that are common. M is for maple. The only maple that we have, native maple that we have commonly here is the ash leaf maple, also called the box elder maple, or just box elder, all the same tree. P is for privet. Unfortunately, we do have several privets pretty widespread here. This is a, an invasive, most of you know, um, and that is very common here, and, and that's one that it's important to be able to recognize so that we can possibly work on getting rid of it. And then R is for rusty black hog, a wonderful little native tree that's very widespread here. Um, e is not in our brochure, but is for elderberry and elbow bush. Those are two that we do see around here. Um, they're not that common and not big, really big enough to be considered trees. So, but it, it might be worthwhile to remember that those two also have opposite leaves. Okay, now that we've answered just those two questions, we're broke, we have our trees broken down into four groups. Compound leaves oppositely attached, which makes up about 10% of our species. Simple leaves oppositely attached makes up about another 10%. So each of those groups only have about four or five members. Compound leaves alternately attached. This is in 20%. So this makes nine or 10 species to look at. And then simple leaves alternately attached, which leaves us with the other 60%. So if we find simple leaves alternately attached, we still have a little ways to go, but um, we've made some progress there. So like I said, the um, link to the brochure is available in the chat. You're welcome to email me or Rick if you would like a printable PDF of it. And I will turn it over to Rick now. Okay, yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, let's take a little walk through our North Texas woods. And we're going to be uh, pointing out, as I mentioned, 18 uh, of our key trees um, that are uh, very valuable to wildlife. So we're going to start, and our first tree, a uh, uh, group of trees that we're going to talk about are going to be the oaks. Um, oaks are pretty easy to identify if you've got acorns. That's the key identifier. All oaks are simple and alternate leafed. And there are two groups of oaks. Uh, there's the red oak group, and from an identification standpoint, those leaves on red oak group uh, trees have bristle tips at the end of the lobes uh, on, those, on those leaves. And the uh, red oak group uh, oaks take two seasons for the acorns to mature. That does not mean they only drop acorns every other year. They have an overlapping cycle. So the, the acorns that began this spring will drop next fall. And the ones that dropped this fall had begun last last spring. It just takes two seasons for them to cycle through their uh, to full maturity. Now the white group on the other hand uh, has no bristle tips on its leaves uh, and its acorns mature in a single season. So whatever starts up in the spring from an acorn standpoint will be dropping uh, in the fall. And a little, uh, little detail about the red oak uh, versus white oak acorns. Red oak acorns are much more bitter. They have more tannin in them, probably because they've been working, been growing for about two years. A lot of you may know that tannins is really a defensive mechanism within plants uh, to make the, um, basically parts of their plant rather distasteful, so the, the critters don't necessarily eat them. Uh, the white oak group acorns are much sweeter. Uh, some of them are human edible sweet off, off the tree. I mean, they're not great, but they're okay. You can eat them. Um, and squirrels are connoisseurs of acorns, and I love to tell this story. Uh, because the red oak acorns are rather bitter, squirrels will tend not to eat them right off when they mature and they drop. They'll bury them first and, and save them for later on in the winter. Where the white oak acorns will be for them more of an eat now type acorn, well, they'll eat most of them. They'll bury a bunch of them, 
but they'll they'll eat them in in the fall, late summer and fall, uh, and uh, they'll let the red oak acorns kind of age in the dirt. And frankly, this is the exact same principle behind wine for you wine drinkers. Uh, with red wine, you have tannins in the wine uh, that requires for a lot of the red wines to be aged a little bit before those tannins soften up enough and the sugars get uh, crank up. Uh, as opposed to white wine, which is a, a drink now type wine for the most part. It's the same principle because of tannins with the acorns and squirrels certainly understand that. Okay, our first tree we're gonna talk about is black jack oak, which in your chapter is a very common tree in that area. This, is, this tree ranges uh, in East Texas and in the post oak savanna uh, to the east of the Blackland Prairie. Uh, and then it, uh, then it doesn't grow uh, hardly at all. I never see them in the Blackland Prairie area itself. And then the, uh, the trees uh, repopulate or growing again uh, heavily uh, within the cross timbers area, both the east and the west cross timbers area. Um, I believe this tree likes sandier soil and just doesn't, uh, can't germinate, doesn't do well in the uh, dark gumbo of the Blackland Prairie ecosystem. Uh, a blackjack oak has three uh, shallow sinuses and lobes. Uh, and as you can see, this is a red oak group. As you can see on this picture, the little bristles at the ends of the lobes here. I'll point a couple of them out. Um, this tree can be uh, relatively small by oak standards. It'll get up to about 60 feet tall, a trunk about two feet wide. Uh, its crown uh, usually has drooping branches and a fairly dense, dense crown. The bark on a uh, blackjack oak is pretty distinctive. It's very dark. Uh, it's thickly fissured and furrow, uh, furrowed with uh, very thick corky, uh, corky ridges. And it can get kind of a blocky look to it also. Uh, the picture on the slide here is pretty, pretty good uh, definition of what a, uh, what a black jack oak trunk looks like. Its acorns are mid-sized to large. Uh, they're round capped and they're about a third of the acorn is covered by, by the cap itself. Um, this tree comes in two forms. In East Texas and in East Cross Timbers, it's a little bit larger. Uh, then you get out to far West Texas as the Blackjack Range continues out into the West and the tree gets, gets much scrubbier. Now, in terms of its value to wildlife, if I can get it, there we go. Uh, the leaves and twigs are eaten by deer and the acorns are eaten by deer, birds, and small mammals. And this tree is a larval host for the horse's dusky wing and the white M hair streak uh, butterfly. And before we move on to the next tree, I just wanna make a point also with native trees in general, they are much more valuable versus introduced or the invasive trees because our, our wildlife uh, is attuned to these trees, uh, to their native trees. And these trees are host to a lot of, a lot of insects, which in turn, and caterpillars, which in turn become food for birds. So it runs through the entire trophic system. Uh, and through the food web with these native trees. That it's not just these couple of butterflies I'm showing you and a few animals that I'm talking about. These trees are viable to thousands of different kinds of uh, species that are out there. Uh, they're very important trees in, in our woodlands. Okay, here's a companion tree to the black jack oak in the cross timbers area. And this is the post oak, uh, one of my favorite oaks. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, this tree is a member of the white oak group and it has very distinctive leaves. It has these five lobe leaves that form a, uh, normally form a Maltese cross, as you can see, as you can see here. Uh, there's no, no spines, because it is a member of the white oak group. Uh, these leaves can be four to six inches long and about the same wide, they're very squarish type leaves. The leaves are thick and leathery, like the black jack oak leaves are. This tree doesn't get real tall, maybe 50 feet, uh, with a two foot trunk. I've seen them with bigger trunks. I've seen four foot trunks on post oaks. This tree could get very broad. It will grow really long, massive lateral limbs that will uh, roll out at a 90 degree angle from the tree. Uh, and uh, they can be just beautiful, beautiful shade trees. Uh, it's a large ranging oak. It ranges in the uh, two thirds uh, from the East Texas over the West, the Eastern two thirds of Texas. And it may be from a a headcount standpoint, the most populous oak in the state. Definitely the largest ranging of them. Uh, this tree, uh, like the blackjack, I didn't mention how long they live. Oaks live pretty long. Both of these species will live to be about 250 years old. Uh, one nuance about the post oak, especially that I like to tell folks that live in urban areas, because this tree is uh, thickly through the mid cities area and runs through the, the metroplex. This tree is very sensitive to ground disturbance, to soil disturbance. It does not handle construction well at all. 
Uh, if its roots get disturbed, uh, it will go under stress quickly and it very well may die. So if you're ever involved around construction projects, trail projects, things of that nature, uh, where the post oaks nearby, give them a wide leeway because they're very sensitive to soil disturbance. Uh, their acorns, you can see those on the lower, lower right there, are very small. Uh, they're, 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 they're sweet and the, the wildlife loves them, but they're very small acorns. Um, uh, leaves and twigs are eaten by deer. That's going to be a little bit of a broken record, folks, because deer you know, eat a lot of leaves and twigs. Acorns are eaten by deer, birds, small mammals. And this tree is the larval uh, host for the horse's dusky wing butterfly and the northern hair streak butterfly. Now we're going to move into what is primarily a blackland prairie tree, but it does its range does uh, does range out to the west and east of just the blackland prairie, and this is one of the finest oaks in North America. And this is this is the bur oak. I love this tree. Um, of course, you're going to say, you're going to have me say that just about every tree. Uh, with uh, in terms of identification, the leaves on a bur oak are are you know, have about seven or nine lobes on them. They're very big. They can get as big as 12 inches long and six inches wide. Uh, this is a, a white oak group, so there's no bristles at the ends of it. And as you note with this photo, you can see a lot of the surface area of this leaf uh, is at the end of the leaf. That's pretty typical for a, for a bur oak, where it has its deeper sinuses in the first half of the leaf, and then it has much shallower sinuses, and so has this big fan at the end of it. Makes it pretty easy to identify. Uh, another easy identification feature is its acorns. It has the largest acorns of any oak in North America. Normally in our area of Texas, uh, they, uh, the larger acorns are about an inch wide by an inch long. In, in its southern range, the acorns for the burrow can be as uh, large as two inches wide and two inches long. Those are acorns you definitely don't want falling out of the top of a burrow and hitting you on the head. This tree can get very large. It can get up to 80 feet tall five to six foot wide trunk with very thick lateral limbs. Everything about this oak is just massive. The, the, the leaves, the trunk, the limbs, uh, the acorns. Um, and it is one of the faster growing oaks. And it's also a very disease resistant oak uh, and a fire resistant oak. Um, it'll live to about 250 years. Uh, there is one of the herd, if you visit the herd, um, that uh, is pushing 300 years old now and is perfectly healthy. Uh, has a live canopy uh, all the way to the end of its branches um, and has been living uh, in, in a moist area for, uh, for uh, pushing 300 years now. Uh, this tree does like lower slopes and, and moist areas. It, it doesn't like long sustained inundation in water, but it does, it does like a, a moisture type environment. It's heavily cultivated as a landscape tree also. Uh, it's valued to wildlife. Its large acorns are prized by deer and small mammals. Uh, the deer eat the leaves, twigs, and bark. And it is the larval host for the Edwards hair streak and the horse's dusky wing butterfly. A companion tree for the uh, bur oak that grows in the Blackland Prairie and also ranges east to west of that area is the chinkapin oak. This is another white oak group uh, uh, oak and it has different leaves for an oak. Uh, they are not lobed and sinus like most oaks are. Uh, it has rather sharply toothed oval leaves that are anywhere from four to six inches uh, long and a couple inches wide, and that, they can be larger than that. Uh, this tree will grow to about 70 feet tall with about a three to four foot trunk, has a more rounded crown. Another distinctive feature of this tree versus like a bur oak, which has a, a fairly dark, heavily ridged bark in its trunk, is it is not heavily ridged and much lighter. This is a pretty good example of a, a mature chinkapin oak trunk here. It's very light gray and just not as deeply furrowed, more of a shaggier, shaggier look um, uh, than, than the bur oak, uh, which it's a companion tree with. Uh, this tree doesn't live quite as long as most of the other oaks, uh, right around 150 years or so. It's, it has the sweetest acorns of the oaks in the area. These you can eat off the tree as a human being. Are they great? No, but they are edible. And I understand, I've never tried it, but I understand if you roast them, they're better that way. So if anybody wants to be adventurous with chinkapin oak acorns, you can give that a shot. Uh, it's, in terms of value to wildlife, the deer eat the leaves and twigs like they do everything else. The acorns, as I mentioned, are sweet and prized by deer, birds, and small mammals. And it is the larval host for the very common gray hair streak butterfly. Now we're gonna talk about a couple of red oaks. And I'm going to talk about them separately, then I'm going to talk about them together, and I'll explain why at the end. The first red oak that we're going to talk about uh, from the area is the Schumard oak. 
um, as a member of the red oak group, it does have bristles at the end of its, uh, end of its, its lobes. Uh, it will generally have about five to nine lobes to it, six to eight inches long, four to five inches wide or so. The Schumart oak will grow very tall, up to about 100 feet tall. Uh, it uh, has a single straight trunk, uh, which, which will be not heavily furrowed. It'll be dark gray, smooth. And as, it, as you move up the trunk and you look up the trunk of a Schumard, uh, you'll see intermittent fissures uh, in, in the older trees. It has a beautiful symmetrical crown, which has made this a very popular uh, landscape tree, uh, cultivated landscape tree uh, in, in Texas. It, this tree is native to the eastern third of Texas. So we're kind of on its western edge of its, of its range here. Then it's a uh, very similar and related oak uh, is the, is the uh, Texas red oak, which is Quercus buckleyi. Um, it is a smaller tree, grows more in central Texas through the middle part of Texas, uh, maybe gets 50, 60 feet tall, tends to be a little bit more multi-trunked. Um, if you will look uh, at the acorns here, I've got two photos. The acorns that have the very flat cap on top like a beret, those are the acorns of a purebred Schumard oak. If you look at the acorns on the right side, those are much rounder uh, and they cover more of the, uh, cover more of the acorns. So that's one way you can tell the Texas red from the Schumard. But here's the catch. Um, we live in the, in the um, kind of the crossover zone. We, the ranges for the Schumard and the ranges for the Texas red, uh, they overlap here. Uh, in, in the Metroplex area. And these two species crossbreed. So we have largely in this area, hybrids. Uh, I used to drive myself crazy trying to figure out if a tree in the woods was a Schumard or Texas red oak. I finally gave up because frankly, most of our trees here are red oaks. They have the genetics of both to varying degrees. Uh, so don't give yourself a heart attack trying to figure out those. Just call them red oaks. And in this area, just call them red oaks and move on. You can see physical propensities based on their genetic makeup in the trees, but these trees are largely mutts in our particular area because of the overlapping uh, range and the, uh, the uh, interbreeding. But with these, these are very valuable trees. Um, they are valuable, uh, they're valuable to wildlife as their acorns are eaten by deer and small mammals. Uh, the deers uh, uh, partake of them and they are the larval host for the horse's dusky winged butterfly. One thing to note before I get off the red oaks is they're susceptible to oak wilt disease, which is a fungal disease. Um, oak wilt is prevalent in central Texas. There are spots of it in the metroplex, uh, which arborists are trying to keep under control. But because of its propensity to get oak wilt disease, and it dies quickly once it gets it, red oaks in general do, uh, this is not being used as a landscape tree quite as much as it used to be because it's a higher risk uh, from a landscape standpoint. Okay, moving on. Now we're going to be moving to elms. Uh, and we're gonna be talking about one elm. The key identifier with elm trees is the leaves themselves have an asymmetrical leaf base. So at the bottom of the leaf, you're gonna have one side from the middle, from the mid, uh, middle of vein, you're gonna have one side of that leaf is gonna be broader and more bowed out than the other side. Uh, the leaves are always simple and alternate with the elms. Uh, and the, uh, the, el the native elms have double tooth margins and they're all pinnately veined. There are some introduced uh, elms in the area that have single tooth margins, so don't let that confuse you, but the native elms are all double tooth margined here. And we're gonna talk about one elm. There's several elms that do live in our area, but we're gonna talk about one. And that is the, uh, uh, the uh, head of the class, and that is the American elm. Uh, beautiful tree, great tree, uh, wonderful tree for wildlife. From an identification standpoint, i uh, got a good picture here of the double tooth margins. You can note that. Notice the, the pinnate veining on this. It almost looks like feather, like, a, like, a, like feather veining. The, the uh, leaves are long amongst the largest of, uh, or they're large amongst the largest of our elm leaves, about six inches long at, at, at the most, three inches wide. Uh, most of the time they're glabrous, which means the top is shiny but not always uh, with young elm trees or young leaves at the lower ends of some elm trees, they can be kind of rough looking and can throw you off a little bit. Um, but most of the time they're shiny and they, they're secondary veins on, and you can look at the back are almost always a single vein. Uh, they don't fork and they're very clean on the backside. Uh, beautiful tree, a uh, beautiful form on this tree. Uh, it can get to hundred feet tall with a four foot trunk, has a flare base. And as the, the branches, 
will branch off at about a 45 degree angle at a very high uh, spot on the tree. And it kind of resembles flowers in a tall vase. Uh, if you think of it that way for the, with a tall American elm. Uh, and it's, that, it makes a beautiful shade tree and a beautiful boulevard type tree. And that's kind of what got it in trouble in the 1920s, uh, which I want to talk about, talk about next. Uh, this tree was almost eliminated by Dutch elm disease in the 20s. Uh, because of its, its beautiful nature, it, it was a beautiful uh, tree to put street side. So our, our eastern and uh, eastern seaboard cities pretty much created a monoculture of American elms, uh, moving them up and down all their major boulevards and, and streets. And that's why we have so many streets named Elm Street or Elm Boulevard, um, because they were beautiful and they created this high, high shade, tunnel type shade when you plant them on both sides. Um, but once again, that was a bit of a monoculture. And then came the Dutch elm disease in the, in the 1920s, which is a fungus that gets into uh, elm trees and American elm was particularly susceptible to it. And basically that fungus uh, kind of tricks the tree into killing itself. Once it gets into the tree, it gets into its vascular system and the tree will stop and plug up its vascular system, its xylem and phloem, to try to stop the spread of the fungus. So it essentially girdles itself and chokes itself to death. And that's, that's how they died and had a very high mortality rate. And when this got into, um, into the cities and got into the outlying areas where these were heavily planted, uh, it spread from tree to tree. Uh, the, the fungus can spread through roots, but it primarily spreads uh, through beetles that go from tree to tree. So it just knocked them down like dominoes. Uh, however, uh, there were, um, uh, members of the American elm um, uh, species that showed a little bit more of a resistance to the Dutch elm disease and survived and trees in the woodlands that were not part of that monoculture survived. We have American elms here. They're fairly numerous. Uh, they mainly grow along stream sides. They like it fairly moist, but they like well-drained stream sides uh, and river sides. Uh, they grow uh, in riparian areas, very common in riparian areas. Um, it is still susceptible to Dutch elm disease, but being spread out, more diverse, in woodlands and the uh, genetics from the more resistant trees as they begin to take hold and populate the woodlands. It's more of a nuisance than it is the disaster it was in the 1920s. Uh, in terms of value to wildlife, the deer eat the leaves and the twigs. Songbirds do eat the seeds. Uh, the seeds come out in early spring. Uh, small mammals also eat, uh, eat the seeds. And uh, this tree is a larval host for many different kinds of, um, of, of uh, butterflies and moss including the morning cloak butterfly, the question mark, uh, the painted lady, uh, the comma, and the Columbia silk moth. A uh, very valuable tree uh, in, our, in our woodland areas. Love that tree, love them all. Now we're gonna talk about an ash tree. We'll talk about the ashes in general. Now this is our first tree that has compound leaves that we've talked about, and they're oppositely attached. So if you see a compound leaf and you see opposite attached, you're probably looking at ashes because they're fairly they're pretty common in our woodlands. They overall comprise about five to 6% of our, our tree count. Uh, they're much higher percent if you go into our uh, riparian areas along stream sides. The seed is a single winged samara, uh, and this species is dioecious, and that means you have male trees and female trees. The male trees produce the pollen, the female trees will produce the seed. And seed is, an, is a pretty easy way to identify the different species of ash that are in this area. The problem is if you're looking at a male tree, you won't have that to discern the difference. Uh, the one ash I'm going to focus on is going to be the green ash, uh, which is the most common uh, species of ash in the North Texas area. We have three types of ash. Three, generally, we have three species of ash here in North Texas, the green ash, the Texas ash, and the white ash. Uh, the, the green ash, uh, grows more in riparian areas down in, the, in your moist wetlands and your, uh, your Texas ash is more of an upland ash and your white ash is more of an upland ash also. And it, it really doesn't grow real numerously here and it's more of an East Texas tree and we're on the very, very Western edge of its, of its range in the East side of the Metroplex. Um, as I mentioned, the leaves are, are uh, compounded opposite, generally with seven to nine leaflets. They'll be normally smooth or real finely toothed. Uh, the leaves will always have a terminal leaf on it, uh, one on the very end of the rachis. These trees in woodland environments can grow very tall, about 80 feet tall, with a straight brown trunk, generally about two to, feet, uh, two to three feet wide uh, at maturity. 
And the trunks are fairly distinctive. Uh, they are tightly interlaced. They have tightly interla interlaced uh, ridges and furrows, and it's kind of in a diamond pattern, as you can see with the photo on the left there. Uh, and in terms of seeds, um, specific to the green ash on the far right, uh, this is a green ash seed or samara. The seed pod is the elevated area at the, at the base here, and you can see the wing actually overlaps over the seed pod, and it's very long and narrow, uh, the seeds inside that seed pod. And another way that you can tell green ash versus the other ashes uh, is the uh, leaf scar itself on the limb. If you look at the lower right, its leaf scar tends to be fully under the new, the new rachis, the new uh, limb that would be there on the tree, where with white and Texas ash, it'll be more of a smile and wrap around that new limb. Uh, now I want to give you some bad news. Uh, we talked about you know, the American elm and how that was a disaster uh, from an ecological standpoint in the 1920s. Unfortunately, I'm going to depress you a little bit because we're in the midst of what's probably an ecological disaster for the ash. Uh, and that is created by an invasive uh, uh, bark beetle called the emerald ash borer. The picture of the emerald ash borer is on the lower, lower left side there. Very small little beetle from Asia, smaller than a penny, about the, about the, about the length, of a, length of a dime. This little guy uh, was inadvertently in, uh, introduced in Michigan around 2000, 2001 in some packing crate material. And within a few years, it had gotten out into their woodlands and killed 40 million ash trees. Once this beetle gets into a tree, uh, it's got about a 95 to 99 percent mortality rate. Uh, the tree will die within two or three years. It has been steadily moving down the Mississippi Valley and moving both east and west from those areas into those states. It is now in Texas. Uh, it's been in a couple of deep east Texas counties for a few years. Uh, I believe two years ago, it was found around Eagle, a pocket was found in Eagle Mountain Lake over in Fort Worth. And about a month ago, I understand it was confirmed it was found in Denton. So it's in Denton County now, which has now made um, Denton County a quarantine area for removing any ash wood out of the county. Um, the way, uh, the way this, uh, this beetle works is uh, the, mature, the beetle will morph into, into a mature beetle will escape the tree it was in uh, in the spring. And so the females will land on another ash tree and lay its eggs. The eggs are really small. You really can't see them uh, unaided. Uh, those eggs hatch. The larva will drill into the bark of the ash tree, get into the cambium layer, and feast off the, uh, the xylem and phloem over a year or two while they're maturing and essentially girdling the tree. So these trees that are under stress will begin to put out suckers. The, the top will start to die off and eventually the tree will die. Uh, very high mortality rate on this. There's no real solutions to the, to the borer other than isolation and quarantining of the wood to try to keep the spread down. Uh, there is an inoculation uh, solution to it uh, of a chemical. Uh, it's brand name, I think it's triage. It, it's expensive and it has its drawbacks too because anything that feeds off the tree is gonna die because it's essentially a poison in the tree. And it can't be widely used in woodland areas. It would be just for special trees that people are trying to uh, trying to salvage. Um, uh, let's see, and that's about it. I just uh, wanted to let you know uh, about the emerald ash borer that uh, is in our area now, and um, it's it's going to be a problem. Uh, and we are probably going to lose generations of ash trees over the next few years. Sorry to depress you about that. Let's move on and talk about a better subject. Uh, the value to wildlife, though, for this tree is uh, that eat the leaves and twigs. Birds and mammals do eat the seeds, the fruit and, and samara, and this is a valuable tree to a lot of different kinds of butterflies, including the tiger swallowtail, the orange sulfur, the cloudless sulfur, and the morning cloak. So let's move on to some other large uh, native North Texas trees. Uh, we're going to be starting with the black walnut, another one of my favorites, another wildlife favorite. Uh, the black walnut leaves are alternate and they are compound. They can have a lot of leaflets, 15 to 23 leaflets. Sometimes this leaf, uh, this uh, leaf will have a terminal leaf on it. Sometimes it won't. So it, it can fool you that way. Uh, however, there's a general shaped black walnut uh, leaves uh, that are helpful in identifying it. The middle leaflets along the rachis will tend to be bigger than the leaflets along either the beginning of the rachis or at the end of the rachis. So a little bit of a football shape to this leaf, uh, in, you know, because of the you know, size of the leaflets. Uh, this tree can get really big, but there's few of them this big. They can get to 100 feet tall um, with a single straight trunk, three, uh, three foot trunk. The trunk is a dark, dark brown. 
uh, with heavy fissures uh, and furrows. And they tend to run at a bit of an angle, so you get a very broad diamond pattern, as you can see from that illustration there. Uh, another way that you can identify, uh, there's a couple of distinctive ways you can identify black walnut. The nuts themselves, you can see some immature nuts uh, hanging on the, the, the leaves there. They're very round. It's a very thick green covering over the actual shell of the, uh, of the black walnut itself, which is inside. Um, if you look over to your lower left, uh, the leaf scar is very distinctive. We call this the monkey face leaf scar because you've got a little bit of scarring within the uh, the, the shape of the leaf scar itself, which look like eyes and a little bit of a smiley face. So a very distinctive leaf scar. Also, if you take a twig uh, and you take a lateral cut through it to get down into the pith of the twig, uh, black walnuts have chambered pith, as you can see by this illustration. Most trees, just about every tree, has solid pith inside of it. If you did this, for instance, with a pecan, you would see a solid peanut butter colored pith. But with a black walnut, you get this chambering going on in there. So that's another telltale way to tell, tell the black walnut uh, from other trees. Uh, the hardwood of a black walnut is beautiful and is probably the finest woodworking um, wood uh, of any hardwood in the country. And for that reason, most virgin black walnuts were all cut down back in the 1800s and early 1900s. That's why I was mentioning you don't see very many 100 foot wall. Uh, tall uh, black walnut trees. Most everything we have is, is second and third growth uh, because, of, uh, because of all the harvesting that was done uh, about 100 years ago or longer. Uh, it likes to grow in rich lowlands and moist uh, fertile slopes and hillsides. This tree has a very long, uh, long tap root, uh, even in its, in its youth. It makes it very hard to transplant, so not, not a good tree. That's why it's not a common landscaping tree. Um, it can live about 130 years. Uh, and it's a very valuable tree from a wildlife standpoint. Uh, it's not an important food source for wildlife, mainly squirrels because squirrels are able to get into the nut. Um, it's a tough nut to crack, very thick. Uh, it's also the preferred larval host for the luna moth and the, uh, and the, and the regal moth. That's the black walnut. Next tree is a much disparaged tree, the black willow. You'll hear people call this a trash tree. Get rid of it, it's a trash tree. Well, I'm gonna give you bullet points to help you defend that because this is anything but a trash tree in woodlands. Would I want this tree in my front yard? Probably not, but do I want it in my woodlands? Absolutely yes. Uh, from an identification standpoint, pretty easy to identify. Uh, they have um, alternate, um, uh, I'm sorry, they have alternate uh, single, uh, single leaves, about three to six inches long. Uh, they're lance shaped and they're very finely toothed. Uh, Lisa mentioned them in her tree ID um, piece. Um, this tree is dioecious, so you have male and female trees. And when the female trees release their seeds, if you look up in the upper, upper right corner there, it's a lot like cottonwood trees do. They have uh, the, the little bitty seeds that are covered in this material that, that will float in the air forever and then has an ability to stick once it gets to a good location. And so that's how it spreads its seeds uh, through, um, through uh, airborne uh, cottony substances. Um, these will grow about 60 feet tall. They can get bigger, but they're short-lived. Fast-growing but short-lived trees, they kind of max out in age about 70 to 80 years. Uh, but they can get 100 feet tall in the right kind of environments. Uh, this is a pioneer species tree that grows along new land, along stream sides, things of that nature, uh, and makes it a very important tree ecologically because it has numerous fibrous roots that really help bind soil and bind stream and riverbanks down. That's one of its important values in our woodlands. Um, uh, it's also uh, an, an interesting thing when you're trail guiding, if you're talking to people about the black willow, its bark contains salicylic acid, which is an active ingredient in aspirin. And so uh, Native Americans and uh, through Native Americans, our, our, our European settlers learned that you could chew on the bark and it would help with headaches, things of that nature. And the salicylic acid is in the tree as a defense mechanism against, uh, against uh, critters that keep it from um, overeating on the tree. Because this tree is loved by a lot of different aspects of wildlife, which we'll talk about now. The bark, tender twigs, and the buds, they're food for browsers such as deer, rabbit, and beaver. This is definitely the preferred tree for beaver. It's their tree of choice uh, when they're just eating along with any of their, uh, their lodge making, but they just eat this tree. Uh, it's fairly soft, it's very nutritious for them. Uh, is the larval host for the morning cloak butterfly, the viceroy, the red spotted purple, and the tiger swallowtail. And it also is a nectar source for our native bees like the carpenter bee and the bumblebee 
and also for our wild honeybees. So is this a trash tree? Absolutely not. This is a very, very valuable tree in our woodlands from many different aspects, both from an erosion control and from a food source aspect for our wildlife. Uh, another very valuable tree from a food source standpoint is the common persimmon, also a very distinctive looking tree. Um, this tree ranges in the eastern quarter of Texas. Uh, I do see this in the cross timbers area, so I know it reaches over through the cross timbers uh, range. Um, its leaves are alternate. They're kind of an oval shape, uh, generally with a pointed tip and smooth margins. And a lot of times they're fairly thick. Uh, they're glabrous on top, they're shiny. And they'll have along their margin, along the edges, kind of a lighter tone coloration, as you can see from that photo. And then if you turn the leaf over, I don't have a good example of it really here in this photo, but if you turn the leaf over, much paler and flat tone and kind of almost downy looking on the backside. This tree is dioecious, so you have male and female trees. It'll grow tall and narrow, about 60 feet tall at maturity, this single straight trunk and a, and a, a dense crown that doesn't venture very far from, from the trunk. It's got a very narrow crown. Um, the bark uh, on the trunk is very dark and very distinctive. It has this blocky, what I like to call alligator hide appearance to it. Uh, that makes it very easy to catch and to, uh, to, to spot in the woods. And, and generally, if you find a persimmon tree, a common persimmon tree, you're going to find others right around it. They tend to grow in groves. They can grow in large thickets. There are, I've seen thickets, I've, I've seen groves in the metroplex area of hundreds of these trees. And I understand there's some areas in deep northeast Texas that has some thickets that are thousands of these trees uh, in size. Um, the, the, the main value for this tree, from my standpoint, is the fruit. The fruit's delicious if you've ever had it, once it's matured and once it's gone sweet, which happens late in the fall, generally after a first freeze. Kind of tastes like a date, but it's really distinctive and it's really sweet. Um, and it can be used to make jellies and jams, but it can be eaten right off the tree. If you take any off, if you harvest any, um, take a small bite first to make sure it's mature. Uh, and then eat them pretty quick. They don't keep very good in the fridge, I will tell you that. This, uh, and this fruit is eaten by a lot of wildlife, so let's talk about that. And the fruit is really high in vitamin C, I didn't mention that. Coyotes love this tree. If you want regular visits from coyotes, put a persimmon tree in your backyard. Uh, an easy way, it's so easy to, to um, identify coyote scat in the fall because it will almost always be full of persimmon seeds. They are all over this tree when the, when the fruit uh, begins, to, begins to mature. They actually eat these before they mature. I didn't mention it before, but before this fruit matures, before that first frost, uh, the fruit is really, really bitter to human beings. Uh, it, it, old farmers would like to give people those as a joke to watch them bite into one and pucker up for about an hour. Uh, possums, raccoons, skunks, deer, and birds also feed upon the fruit and is a larval host for the luna moth and a nectar source uh, for uh, all types of bees. Uh, great tree, great tree, common persimmon. Another tree, uh, a very interesting tree, is the honey locust, um, which is um, a rather mean looking, aggressive looking tree. Um, pretty easy to identify for various reasons. Um, the, leaves are, the leaves on this tree are alternate, single, and sometimes double compound with 15 to 30 of uh, these little oval leptical leaflets. Uh, they're real fine tooth, they're very small. Uh, the trunk itself can get about 30 inches wide, and its defining characteristic from a trunk standpoint normally would be these really, really nasty, gnarly uh, thorns that you'll find all over them. This was a particularly uh, uh, aggressive looking uh, tree that I had found uh, deep in the uh, woodlands at the herd, herd sanctuary in McKinney. It had, it had uh, thorns on thorns on thorns. Um, and the theory, you know, why does this tree grow these thorns? The theory behind why it spends all its energy growing these thorns is that it was a defense mechanism that it just no longer needs, a bit of an anachronism for this tree. Uh, it was a defense mechanism uh, to keep mastodons and giant sloths and other megafauna that used to live in North Texas 10 to 13,000 years ago, but have since been extinct since then, to keep them from knocking over the tree or trying to climb the tree and damaging the tree. Because if you were an intelligent mastodon, I doubt if you would want to headbutt that tree that's in the picture. Um, another distinctive feature on this tree are the seed pods, which are very long, could be about a foot long, very velvety in touch. And the inside of the seed pod has uh, a pulp in it, which is very sweet, smells good, and is uh, edible, uh, quite edible. Uh, Native Americans would make tea out of it, make flour out of it, and so would our European settlers. 
the seeds themselves are toxic to humans, but birds will, will eat the seeds. Uh, this, when this tree flowers in the, in the spring, when the females flower in the spring, this tree is dioecious. When it flowers in the spring, uh, it does yield a good honey. So this is a favorite tree for, for honey makers out there because they, like, uh, they like their honeybees to be feeding off of honey locusts. They make a very sweet honey. Uh, as I mentioned, the pulp, the pulp is eaten by deer, birds, small mammals. It's very sweet and quite edible. Seeds are eaten by birds. Uh, and this tree is the larval host for the spotted skipper, the bicolored locust moth, the bisected locust moth, and is a nectar source for our bee populations. It's a good tree. It's a cool tree. Pecan, state tree of Texas. This, this is the um, widest ranging of our hickories. A pecan is a hickory tree. Uh, the leaves on the, on the uh, pecan are alternate compound. Uh, with 11 to 17 slightly curved back leaflets. This photo is a good example of that. The term for that is facile, if anybody ever says that. That means the leaflets curve back towards the, uh, the base of the leaf itself. You'll always have a terminal leaf on a pecan, and its leaves, remember I mentioned the black walnut, the leaflets tend to be bigger in the middle. With a pecan, they, the leaflets tend to get larger as you go towards the end of the leaf. So that's one way that you can tell a, a black walnut from a pecan. Uh, another way you can tell the difference between the two trees is the trunk itself. If you look at the trunk here, that's yours truly there holding this tree up. It was about to fall. I'm very strong. Uh, it's more of a gray color and it's got a shaggy bark uh, and not near as deeply furrowed as a black walnut, uh, black walnut tree is. Also, as I mentioned, the pith is a solid, is a solid peanut butter colored pith uh, within the twigs. Um, uh, and a beautiful tree, extremely valuable tree in our woodlands can get really big, 120 feet tall, six foot trunk, very, very large tree. They can live up to, 100, to 300 years. Um, and a mature tree can, can grow as many as 70 to 150 pounds of pecans in a, in a mast year and in a, in a good year for it. The U.S. produces, you may not know, the U.S. produces 85 to 90, 95% of the world's pecans. And Texas is the number two pecan producer in the country behind Georgia. Uh, the nuts very rich in protein. I guess we'll get to the wildlife benefits here. They're rich in protein, oil, and minerals, and prized by birds and small mammals. I had already mentioned the productivity of these pecan trees, and this, and this tree is the larval host for the gray hair street butterfly. A truly great tree in our woodlands. Now for the red mulberry. A little bit of a smaller tree. I always battle myself with mentally about, is this a canopy tree? Is this not a canopy tree? It kind of depends upon where you are. Uh, in the woodlands and where its range is. A wide ranging tree that uh, ranges through the eastern two thirds of Texas. And this is a tree that has a hard time making up its mind about what it wants to look like and how it wants to behave. Let's talk about it from an identification standpoint first. Looking at the leaves on the left side, um, they tend to, a purebred red mulberry tends to be hairy on top, rather rough and flat looking on top. Uh, they can be multiple lobed. They can have no lobes. They can have two lobes. A telltale uh, sign of a mulberry leaf is the mitten shape, as you can see on that one leaf. So even within a single stem, as you can see here, you can have different lobing on its leaves. Another way you can tell if you've got a mulberry is break off a leaf, squeeze the petiole, and see if any milky sap comes out of the end of it. Uh, it has a little bit of a latexy sap in there. That's a way that you can tell this tree. Uh, it'll grow to about 50 feet tall, um, and it will. Um, it, it grows a low spreading crown. And it's a fruit tree, so they don't tend to live real long, about 75, about 75 years. This tree leaves real early, too. Once it starts to leaf, uh, it's kind of considered a harbinger of the spring. The frosts are over with. Um, uh, in terms of its, take a look at its fruit. Then I'm going to talk about the wild, because that's its key, is its fruit. It's, it looks like a long blackberry. and uh, It's very rich uh, in vitamin C, K, B complex. A and E, iron, potassium, magnesium, and it's an important food source for all sorts of birds and mammals. They don't last long on the tree once they begin to uh, begin to mature. Uh, and this is the larval host for the morning morning cloak butterfly. Also, one last note about the red mulberry tree: it's on a little bit of a uh, it's, it has an issue. Um, it is hybridizing with an introduced type of mulberry called the white mulberry. They interbreed and they hybridize. And as they've been doing that, uh, research has indicated that the white mulberry genes tend to over, over ride the red mulberry genes. And there's a concern that eventually these hybrids are going to become more and more over successive generations, more and more leaning towards being white mulberry trees 
uh, which don't have as good a fruit um, and are it's an Asian Asian mulberry. Uh, not a terrible tree, but it's we're losing steadily our red our pure red red mulberry trees. Uh, and over time, uh, we may not have any purebred red mulberry trees going down the road. More good news for you. All right, let's move on to the next tree, which is the sugar hackberry. Another bit of a maligned tree, especially in urban areas. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about that, why it's that way. Large ranging tree around the eastern two thirds of Texas. Its leaves are alternate, simple, and lance shaped, as you can see from the middle of the photo, with a, a tapering tip. And normally it'll lean over to the right. It'll have a little bit of a lean to the right, a little bit like a little bit like elm, elm leaves do. Uh, they're rather thick. Uh, unlike elm leaves, though, the veins, if you look at the end of the petiole, there's actually three principal veins that will fan off. You have a middle vein and a couple of uh, large side veins that fan off from there, uh, from the petiole also, and then you have your secondary veins. Uh, the tree can grow pretty tall, about 80 feet tall, three foot trunk. Uh, its trunk is very distinctive, very easy to tell this tree from a distance because of these random warts that are all over it. Um, the number of warts on hackberries can vary greatly to, from almost no warts at all with a smooth gray trunk uh, to covered, absolutely thick with warts um, and, uh, and anywhere in between. Um, and the tree will live about 100, 150 years. The problem with this tree is if, a, if the wood gets exposed to the air or the soil, it is prone to rot and it will begin to decline once that happens. So if a limb breaks or it gets a wound on it, it begins to decline. Um, it just doesn't handle exposed air or soil uh, well at all. But its value to wildlife is important in our woodland areas. The leaves and twigs are browsed for deer and the berries persist in the winter. And this is an important uh, winter source of food for, uh, for our birds uh, during, during a time when there's not as much available for them. Uh, they will go into the hackberries and that will help them subsist through winter months. It is also the larval host for the aptly named hackberry emperor butterfly. Okay, we have a handful of smaller understory trees we'll go through now. Uh, these are fun trees too uh, to talk about. The first one up to bat is the Hercules Club. Uh, the leaves on a Hercules Club are, are alternate and compound. They have seven to 17 leaflets, so they'll always have a terminal leaf on it. Um, a distinctive feature of Hercules Clubs, because they look a little bit like some other trees with compound leaves, um, is, are these spines. I'm circling some little spines here at the base of these two leaflets, and I have a blow up here showing these little spines. They're not always there, but if you see these spines, you know you've got yourself a Hercules Club. If you can't see the trunk, because the trunk on a Hercules Club is extremely distinctive uh, with these, uh, what we call shark's tooth uh, corky extrusions. Initially, when these grew on the trunk, they had a thorn at the end of them, but those fall off pretty quickly. And so you end up with this shark's tooth trunk uh, look. Uh, and it's a very distinctive feature of the Hercules, Hercules Club. It's not a big tree, just about 30 feet tall, about 12 foot wide trunk. Uh, this tree is native to the eastern half of Texas. It likes well-drained soil. It, I find this along woodlands edges most of the time. It likes some sun and it will grow along fence rows. Not a long-lived tree either. It grows to about uh, 50 years. Uh, the fun, fun fact about Hercules Club tree, uh, and its other name, the toothache tree, is if you chew on a stem or chew on a couple of leaves, it will numb your mouth. And so it was a common toothache remedy uh, of Native Americans and of our European settlers before they could go to Kroger and get aspirin and Tylenol. In terms of wildlife uh, value, the deer forage on the leaves, birds and small mammals will eat the fruit and the seeds, and it is the host for the giant swallowtail butterfly, uh, the larval host for the giant swallowtail butterfly. It's a nectar source for our butterflies and our bees in the flowers in the spring. Mexican plum, uh, another great fruit tree. Uh, its leaves are fairly distinct. This is a distinctive looking tree, pretty easy to identify. They're alternate and simple. Uh, they're toothed. The tree, uh, the leaf has a pointed tip, rather, rather, uh, rather smooth tops to them. And generally they'll, they'll fold over like you see this photo here. I used to always think these trees were needing water. Uh, they just have that fold over growth to them and they tend to look a little like they're stressed, but they're really not. Um, but that's real common. The, the leaf is fairly thick uh, also. Its trunk is platy, has amber tonations to it, and has a lot of plates on it like this I mean, on a mature trunk. It will tend to peel off on the edges. In the springtime, this is the first tree to flower. It will flower before it leaves. 
um, which makes it a very important uh, leaf for uh, any pollinators that are out looking, looking for, uh, for nectar or any nectar feeding insects that are looking for nectar early in the spring. Um, uh, and then after the flowers mature, then the leaves will pop out after that. And once, once the uh, flowers fertilize, you will get the plums off the trees. You can see on the right side. The plums are okay to eat. They're better to add a bunch of sugar to them and bake them in the jellies and jams and things of that nature. Uh, but you got to get to them pretty quick because the wildlife goes after them uh, pretty fast. They're prized by deer, small mammals, and birds. Uh, and this tree is also the larval host for the tiger swallowtail and the cecropia moth. In addition, it's a nectar source for our native bees and for other, any in general pollinators and butterflies because it's such an early flowering tree. Rough leaf dogwood, a very small tree. Most of the time, granted, it's a bush. It doesn't grow in the tree very often unless it's in fairly deep shade. Uh, generally, if it's along an edge, which is where I find these most of the time, it will be a much kind of a bush, about 10 to 12 feet tall. Uh, fairly easy to identify here. Uh, it has smooth oval uh, leaves with the veins. This is distinctive to dogwoods. You can see the veins will start off from the middle of vein, and as they move out towards the margin of leaf, they will curve and run parallel to the margin before it gets there. So they're not like completely featherly pinnate. They come out and then they begin to curve. Very distinctive feature of our dogwoods. Um, and the top of the leaf is very rough. That's why it hits the name rough leaf dogwood. It makes it easy to identify. This tree, as I said, it grows as a large bush or a small tree. You get up to about 16 feet tall. Ranges throughout our area here. A very valuable wildlife tree. That's why it's in this set. It, it likes to grow along woodland edges. We see thickets of this along woodland edges quite a bit. Um, and they can be pretty dense thickets. Uh, it likes limestone-based alkaline soils, but we also see it off of the Blackland Prairie alkaline soils also. And they're pretty long lived for not being very big, about 80 years. Um, uh, the uh, leaves are, uh, are simple and oppositely attached to, which I, I failed to mention, sorry. Uh, but they are, they are simple and they're obviously attached, which makes it in the minority of the trees and easy to identify. Um, the leaves and twigs are eaten by deer. Those of blooms, which are cream colored and come out in April through May, are very valuable to our bees, butterflies, and other insects, very popular. And then the white berries, once they mature, uh, they're eaten by at least 40 species of birds and other wildlife. And if you're a birder, just go find yourself a, uh, in the late summer and fall, find yourself a, a good thicket line of rough leaf dogwoods because you're going to see all sorts of birds flitting in and out of those birds. It's like a party during that time of year as they're feeding on the berries with all, the, all these different species of birds. It's pretty hilarious. Okay, our last tree. We're almost there, home stretch. The rusty black hall viburnum. A small tree but a beautiful tree and a valuable tree. Its leaves are opposite and simple also. Uh, the leaves are thick Glabrous on top, very fine tooth, has a very blunt end, and actually the end on a lot of the leaves will have be a little bit, have a little bit of an inset there, a little bit of a notch in it, and they're about three inches long. It's a small tree, it will grow up to about 18, 18 feet tall. It has very distinctive bark, the, the mature tree does. Um, as you can see, it's very blocky, small, kind of has that alligator bark, and if you're looking at the tree in the winter, look at its buds. As per its name, it has its very rusty looking uh, leaf, leaf bud here. And also, if you're looking at it during the summer, if you look at its petioles, it'll have rusty hairs along its petioles uh, also. Uh, when this tree fruits, when these flowers are germinating, the tree fruits, it creates these little football shaped uh, berries, which will turn a purple dark blue uh, in the fall. And they are human edible. So let's talk about the fruit. Uh, let's talk about the flowers first. The flowers are a nectar source for bees, butterflies, and other insects. And the fruit is edible, uh, eaten by all sorts of animals and 60 species of birds. Kind of tastes like a weird raisin, uh, but it's, um, and you'd have to eat a lot of them to get filled up as a human being. But um, like I said, the wildlife loves them. And it's a pretty little tree and probably should be used in landscaping more. So if you're doing native, native wildscaping in your, in your yard looking for a small tree, this is, this is a really good tree to put out there. Uh, and uh, with that, we are at the end of our walk through the woods. These are the resources that I've used along with personal experience um, to uh, create this presentation. Um, and then we're going to open it up now, I think, for, for Q&A. Well, Catherine Wells and I would like to find a rusty black hub by Vernon. <laughs> Do you have any sources for that? From a culture standpoint? Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, it, it's one of those trees that should be available in, you know, 
at, at landscapers and uh, uh, more often. Maybe in Frisco, it might be available at, uh, uh, what's the? Shades of Green. Shades of Green, thank yeah. you. Or maybe they could order it, because yeah. they'll do that a lot there too. If they don't have it, they'll order trees and order plants for you there. The Shades of Green in Frisco, they didn't catch that. They will try to have them at the herd plant sale this fall, but they, they have a hard time finding them. Yeah, okay. Someone else had a comment that did black jacks get oak wilt? And Lisa said yes, and this person thought they had lost several to oak wilt. Yeah, all so, oaks are susceptible to oak wilt, and black jack oak being a red oak, uh, is more susceptible than white oak group oaks. Um, the, this is, I'm generalizing a little bit, but your red oaks, when they get oak wilt, it hits them hard and fast, and they generally will die within months. Um, with the white oak group, it's a much, they're more resistant to oak wilt, and even if they get it, it, it becomes more of a very slow process, which can be managed more. The problem with the red oaks is if they get it, it's like moves so fast, it can't even be managed by an arborist. Uh, and so they are correct. Blackjack oats will also get oak wilt. No, anything about the black hickory tree? I live east cross timbers and think I have one. I, I'm not an expert with hickories uh, other than uh, pecans, mainly because I'm a little blackland prairie centric. Uh, and we don't have, even though I was schooled in East Texas, it's been a while. Um, and we don't really have many hickories in the blackland prairie area, so I don't see them often. Matter of fact, Lisa and I just were up at Ray Roberts uh, uh, State Park uh, a few days ago, and we're looking at hickories, and like, well, what kind is this? I mean, we know that there are black hickories, there are mockernut hickories, and there are bitternut hickories that are pretty common in, in East Texas, and I believe in the Cross Timbers area also. Um, I have a hard time telling them uh, from a distinction standpoint, and I need tools like iNaturalist or, or books to help me figure it out. I'm just not that first with them, but they're there. They are definitely uh, Cross Timbers trees. Well, thank you, Lisa and Rick, especially taking this on in short notice. It was a great presentation. And uh, we're getting lots of chats saying how much they enjoyed your presentation. Right. Well, we appreciate doing it. It thank was, it was fun. Us. We'll see everyone next month.